I'm Karen Spelka, State Senator for uh, this district and uh, State Senator with working with so many of you here. I want to thank you all for coming and thank you for joining us for this very important conversation about social and emotional learning. I want to thank you for taking the time for coming tonight because it is such a critically important issue uh, and that this, I think, is our third session in, in doing this, and it's great. I want to thank particularly uh, Framingham State University, President Sabales, who uh, isn't able to be here, but uh, Linda Baden-Gode was going to give some readings. I don't know if Linda's here yet. Uh, if not, oh, right here, come on up. I didn't see you. Great, yeah, come on up. Uh, the Framingham State is, has kindly sponsored this event, so I want to introduce the uh, Provost and Vice President for <laughs> Academic Affairs and my friend, Linda Bates. Good evening. I'm so happy to be able to welcome you this evening to this very important event here at the Warren Center, Conference Center at Inn. And uh, here at Ashland, and now it is a significant part of Birmingham State University. Beautiful grounds, I'm sure you've walked here, trails, facilities, great food. It is also home to a very important food study that we're doing in collaboration with Boston Children's Hospital. We have a new hospitality and tourism management major that begins this next week. Uh, and this is a beautiful and shared asset for you and our whole community. I want to thank in particular Senate President Karen Spilko for preserving this center for our community as she begins this important term as our leader in the Senate. So thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the facilities team, all of the folks who are at the Wine Center who work so hard to help make this such a beautiful place. As Linda mentioned, uh, there's a lot. If you haven't been here, come back during the day uh, and take a little tour. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It's right on the reservoir. They have an inn. They have facilities here. Uh, it's, it'll be a tremendous resource. It's very exciting, the new academic possibilities that will happen, that will open up a world for uh, new jobs here in Metro West and beyond. Jobs that are in demand, that uh, there really is no place uh, east of uh, the western part of the state that has these kind of, of uh, academic offerings and curriculum. So thank you for doing that. I want to also thank the Learning Center for the Deaf for signing tonight and doing a terrific job. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Jim Vetter and the Social Emotional Learning Alliance for helping together uh, to gather a great program for all of us tonight. And thank you to Jennifer Cutler, Elise Gorseth, Beverly Hugo, and David Kine for sharing your expertise with us and you will hear from them very shortly. I'd also like to thank uh, specific, some, and acknowledge some folks that are here. Uh, Mayor Spicer, Representative Carmen Gentile, welcome. Uh, there are many, many school committee members, su uh, school superintendents, city councilors, board of selectmen, other state and local officials, parents, students, Mass Bay Community College uh, President Dave Podell. I apologize for not mentioning every single one of you, but that would take about 10 minutes. Uh, and I, I would like to try to stay on time to some extent. Um, I'd also like to finally uh, thank the school committee members um, that have been volunteers here tonight. This does take a lot of coordination. They came here early, they helped sign you up, they helped direct you. Uh, this is the third session that we have ha held on social emotional learning, and they have volunteered because they care. And they, they work so hard, so I'd like to give them all a round of applause as well. And lastly, I would like to thank um, 
my district team, uh, who are phenomenal, who organized this. They make me look good, I have to say. It's them. It's them. So I'd like to especially thank Pooja Mehta. I don't know where Pooja is. I'm back there. Thank you, Pooja. My district director. Hopefully all of you know her. Uh, and our district team, Dennis Giambetti, Sue Hippo, and Nick Montgomery is here. Dennis is back there, too. I don't know where Sue is. Um, Sue is over here. So uh, all together, we are here to help you and assist you in any way that we can. So this is my third year that we've put on a social emotional learning event. The fact that there are so many of you in attendance proves just how much of an interest there is in promoting the health and well-being of our students, which is a really great thing, I have to say. The goal of my Metro West Kids Initiative has always been to identify strategies to help all of our children learn, grow, and succeed with a focus on social and emotional learning. As we know, and we've known for several years, these skills are key for social, emotional, and academic success. And there is, I believe, growing acceptance in the fields of education, mental health, and public policy that these skills should be taught from an early age. We agree that we need to teach and support the whole child and so tonight, we are focusing on successful implementation strategies for SEL, both in our schools and in our communities. At the State House, my work to ensure high quality education for all of our children through budget investments, legislation, and meetings or events like this one tonight will continue. As we begin the 2019-2020 session, we had approach budget season. Education funding, I promise you, will remain a top Senate priority. In addition, one of my personal priorities as Senate President is to focus on mental health parity and ending the stigma around mental illness. I believe that we should, be make, we should be making mental health care as routine as physical health care. It should be treated the same. <laughs> Just like if somebody went to a doctor for diabetes or some heart issue, and if a person goes to a doctor, and they get referred to a specialist and can see a specialist pretty quickly, we should be doing the same for mental health. If somebody says to their primary care physician that they need help, they should get, be able to get referred out and see a behavioral health specialist quickly as well. Oops. We must do more to implement creative, preventative strategies around mental health so that we can help people before they get are in the grip of addiction, PTSD, bullying, we have kids in school with a bullying, or other hard to overcome situations. Obviously, one of the best places to implement preventative care is among young people, and that's why social and emotional learning is so important. So I'd like to again thank all of you for your commitment to social emotional learning and simply for your commitment to our children. I look forward to hearing from our panelists their thoughts and experiences and I hope that all of the folks in this room will share their perspectives. So let's get started to find ways that we can bring the latest social and emotional learning strategies into the Metro West classrooms. And again, I thank you. I turn it over to our terrific panelists. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Better, and I am the executive director of the Social Emotional Learning Alliance for Massachusetts. In addition, 
addition to that, I'm also with a global nonprofit called Education Development Center. Uh, and I am so happy to see you here tonight. Uh, I'm happy to see you here for a couple reasons. One is, if you're helping somebody to plan a party, it's always nice when people actually show up. <laughs> the other reason I'm really happy to see you here tonight is because coming out on a weekday evening, on a day where the weather can start off very well, is a sign of the kind of, that this many people are here tonight, is an indication of the kind of commitment that an interest folks have around social emotional learning. And if someone who cares about this topic deeply, to see so many others here who care about it is really hard. The same way it is so just amazing the commitment that Senate President Spilka has shown to education and specifically to social emotional learning um, over a number of years uh, is really amazing. Uh, she's really a leader throughout the state in this area. And it's really wonderful that you're doing this forum and that you invited us here tonight. So I'm just curious about who else is here. So I'm wondering, I know that people may have come here tonight in several different roles, um, but I'm wondering who came here tonight primarily in your role as a parent or family member? Who came here tonight primarily in your role as an elected official? Who came here primarily in your role as a community organization, someone who works in a youth serving organization out in the community. And who here is primarily here in your role as a student? <laughs> who here is primarily here in your role as an educator? Lots, okay. And how many people here are teachers of one sort or another? Great. How many people here are student support staff, so school counselors, social workers, psychologists, right? How many people here are school or district administrators? Great. And how many people here are in some other role that I forgot to mention? <laughs> Excellent. We'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. In the panel today, I think you'll see many of these different roles represented. And the main question we're going to be asking is, what are some key questions to ask within your own community around social emotional learning? And what's happening in your community around social emotional learning? Okay. The slides you'll see tonight, and there'll just be a few of them, plus lots of the handouts, digital versions of the handouts, and lots of other resources are available at slformass.org slash forum. So if you go there, you can find these kind of resources and share those with others. And as we're going through tonight, as you hear interesting things, as ideas spark you, if you've got your digital device with you, feel free to tweet it out, post it out, and use the hashtags MetroWestKids and SELformass to share this with others. Uh, and we'll do it for me again. We at SEL for Mass, we are the grassroots organization for Massachusetts promoting effective SEL in communities all across the state. And we are an almost entirely volunteer organization, and we invite you to become part. If you care about seeing SEL happen in your own community and see it happen across the state, we invite you to come sign up, join us. Membership is free, um, and that's one way that we can get resources to you there's a new report that's just about to break coming out in just about a week. And we'll send that out to everyone who signed up uh, if you sign up on, this, uh, on our site. And our next event, we have day-long planning events for SEL in the community. There's one coming up at the end of the month in Danvers. You can find out about that on our site as well. But what are we talking about? When we talk about SEL, right, there's a lot of buzz around SEL these days. And, and there are a lot of kind of related ideas. You can hear people talking about growth mindset, or soft skills, 
for executive function, that these are all closely related. In the course of tonight, we're really going to just focus around social emotional learning. But we just know that many of these other ideas really that the same principles will apply. And when we're talking about SEL, what exactly is it? Well, SEL, social emotional learning, is the process through which children and adults, we're not off the hook, acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, to set and achieve positive goals, to feel and show empathy for others, to establish and maintain positive relationships, and to make responsible decisions. Who here has someone in their life who you think would be important if they had these skills? How many of you can think of an adult in your life who you wish had more of these skills? <laughs> and, and, and if you came with them tonight, don't look at them right now. <laughs> what happens if we help young people and adults develop these kind of skills? What are the results? Well, lots of educators have been working around SEL for many, many years, but it's really only within the past few years that we had the level of research that we do now to know how effective this is. It was a meta-analysis that looked at dozens of studies of social emotional learning and what the impact was in communities that have high quality systematic social emotional learning, what they saw was reduced emotional distress. They saw less anxiety, less depression. They saw fewer negative behaviors, less conflict, less violence. They saw improved attitudes and behaviors. They saw people getting along better, young people feeling more connected to school and the community. And there were folks who were worried about, you know, if we do this in our schools, are we taking away from, from an important academic time? Well, what they found was actually quite the reverse that in communities that were using a systematic approach to social emotional learning, they saw improved academic outcomes. And in this, in this meta-analysis, they saw, on average, 11 percentile points higher in these communities on standardized test scores, which we know are not the all and end all. But they drive a lot of what happens. So if we implement effective SEL, you can see many positive results. Uh, how many people have ever seen this pie chart? This, this, yeah. So in your handouts, you have much more information about this. But these are kind of the key areas of social emotional learning. From the internal ones, developing skills around self-awareness, just even recognizing your own emotions, self-management, being able to calm down when you're upset, for example. So these kind of intrapersonal skills. The social awareness, recognizing other people's feelings and perspective. Relationship skills, effective communication and negotiation. And this all comes together around responsible decision. In communities where SEL is being done effectively, it's done on a multiple tiered basis. All students need and deserve effective social emotional learning. Some students are at higher risk. They need additional supports. And some individuals are already showing signs of distress, but they need some individual help. But when we put this all together, then we get an effective system. And the more we invest here in the bottom, it, the more we invest in making sure that there's proactive social emotional learning for all young people, then the fewer people need these higher tiers. So we can save distress, we can save lives, and as a community, we can save money by investing in proactive social emotional learning. And it's a process that we've got to really embed throughout. 
We need to explicitly teach skills. And we need to make sure that this is really reflected throughout the day for young people in our communities. So, as you think about, we're about to hear about what's happening around social emotional learning in several different communities in this area. But as you think about what's happening around social emotional learning in your community, in your handouts, there's some questions to think about. And we'd like to invite you to think about four areas. And then the handouts are just to take back to your community with you. How is SEL prioritized within your community? In your community, from the role that you're in, if you're a parent or family member, what tells you that social emotional learning is important in this community? If you're an educator, what communicates that to you? And so on. Uh, how is SEL implemented in your community? What kind of systematic efforts are happening to promote social emotional competences? And how is it then integrated throughout the day, throughout the age levels, throughout all the settings in which young people live their lives? How is SEL operationalized? What are the kind of systems and supports in place? For example, if you look within your school district, where is social emotional learning in the budget? They talk about budgets as really being a statement of priorities. And how do you monitor and evaluate? How do you know what's happening? And how do you know it's giving you the results you're looking for? So as you're thinking about in your own communities, these are some key questions to be asking. What's already in place? Where do you find some gaps? And how do you fill those gaps? So now we're going to hear from several different communities in the area about how they're addressing some of these issues. And I'd like just to invite the panelists to introduce themselves. You can just uh, say your name, your town, and what your role is. Hi, I'm Elise Horseth. I'm a parent of three third graders in Phoenix, and I'm also a parent liaison for our CPAC organization. <coughs> Good evening, I'm Beverly Hugo, the 2018 president of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. I'm on my fifth term as on the Framingham School Committee. I'm a former Boston and Brookline public school teacher, and I'm a staunch proponent of SEL. Hello, my name is Jennifer Cutler. I am the Director of Counseling and Social Emotional Learning for the Ashland Public Schools. Um, this is a very new role, both for me and for Ashland. I just started in October, and prior to that, um, I worked as a school psychologist and school justice counselor for most of my career in the Milford Public Schools. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Hi, my name is David Kine. I'm the principal of the Miller Elementary School in Holliston, Massachusetts. Um, I've been in Holliston for 20 years now. Um, prior to that, I was a fourth and fifth grade teacher in Marlboro, Mass. Okay. So I'm wondering for each of you, uh, what is it that tells you, how do you know that social emotional learning has been set as a priority in your community? What are some of the things that they did? What's one thing, if you think about it? What's one thing that tells you that for your own community? So um, I can say that in Natick, um, we are on the first year of a five-year plan to revamp our social emotional learning curriculum. And just the fact that our brand new superintendent held listening sessions over the summer and um, invited parents into her office to tell them what was important. And by and large, um, the most important thing that came from parents across the spectrum was the social emotional well being of their kids in school and not academics. And um, you know, I give great kudos to our amazing new superintendent, Anna Nolan, for taking that seriously and putting an action plan in place. We made sure that the school committee goals, the superintendent's goals, the district goals were all aligned with our principles and our um, priorities. And social and emotional wellness was a priority. Also on our state board, we 
just we just did the priorities for the 2019 goals and number one is to increase achievement but number two is to improve social and emotional wellness the top two goals this year I think that just the fact that our school committee in Ashland and our um, superintendent Jim Adams um, and our administration at every level um, created this role, um, I think that um, some of you here tonight uh, may be surprised to hear that um, there is a director of social emotional learning. I know that it's something that I have really just heard about in the last few years. I think that um, in our state of Massachusetts, um, as I've been getting to know other directors in this position, um, I think maybe it's been in the last three to four years this has become a role, and it really is in its infancy. So I think the fact that when I came into Ashland, um, and really for me when I interviewed for this position, um, I was I knew right away that this was the place that I wanted to be um, because the passion and the commitment to um, making social emotional learning a priority, um, not only in the schools but in the community of Ashland as a whole, was extremely evident. And as I I started to try to immerse myself as much as I can in the community, get to know different community groups and parents and teachers and educators. Um, it's really obvious um, and exciting that this is a huge priority for the community. And I go back about seven years when the district started doing district-wide professional development on social emotional learning, um, looking at executive functioning, looking at um, you know, underdeveloped skills um, that students have. I also look at our um, district and school goals and social emotional learning has been a priority uh, over the last five years on our district goals. And I also look at the commitment that the district has done on creating uh, student and staff uh, stress task forces and looking at um, you know, some of the areas that we need to work on. So it sounds like the folks are looking to see what's happening around SEL in their own communities. They might look at things like district goals, look at the mission statements that are social emotional learning uh, represented there. Uh, it sounds like you're then looking at what are the kind of plans in place that, and, and what kind of input uh, has been uh, uh, solicited for those plans who's involved in putting those plans together, um, and to what extent do those plans really reflect this kind of comprehensive approach to social emotional learning. Um, and then, how is it really uh, supported? What's the kind of professional development that's in place? Uh, how do staff learn the kinds of strategies and skills and approaches that they can use to, to implement SEL? Um, and what's the kind of staffing structure in place that supports it? Is it clear who's responsible for SEL in the district, um, and is there time available to do that kind of coordinating of the work uh, to make sure that it really happens. Um, so it sounds like those are some of the things folks might be looking at in their own communities. And what about in terms of implementing and integrating SEL? And what's it look like in terms of the experience of the students? Uh, if they, when we think about it for, for a particular school, what does the implementation of SEL, how do you help students gain those kind of competencies? So it's almost like, um, Jim, you and I talked yesterday, and we talked about, just do teachers really buy into this? And, and one of my examples is, you know, if you don't set your classroom routines at the beginning of the year, then you're, you're never going to get good classroom routines over the course of the year. If you're not focusing on SEL strategies with your students, early on, then it's going to be very difficult for them to pick up strategies um, to navigate the school day and the school year. Um, so one of the things is teaching these skills early and often. Um, one of the things we use in Holliston is the Open Circle program. Um, it, it's not the end all be all, but it, it is one of the programs that we use to teach some of these strategies uh, with our students. We started training our teachers in 99. Um, we, have, we did a retraining of all of our teachers, I think it was three years ago, and every new teacher that comes through, we also send to get training in it. 
And again, it's not the only thing that we're doing. We're also teaching zones of regulation, growth mindset, uh, mindfulness strategies. We're teaching students how to be organized. The teachers are modeling. You can't say enough about modeling, modeling, modeling. If they aren't modeling these strategies, then the students are going to learn these strategies. They've got to be able to practice these strategies. Not every student comes into our school knowing how to build relationships with their peers. You've got to teach those strategies to students. You have to role play <coughs> with students um, so that they can learn how to do that. And sometimes they need to fail in those role plays so that you can talk about those um, as you go through. Um, but it's it's the constant teaching of those strategies to the students. And so you actually explicitly teach these kind of social and emotional learning skills um, and in also <coughs> using an evidence-based program. Uh, and then on the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning site, there is a guide to social emotional learning programs, which lists programs that have evidence of effectiveness. Um, Open Circle is one. Many communities in this area use other programs as well um, that also have evidence of effectiveness. Um, and it sounds like you're making sure that it's also really embedded, that, that as you're saying, that adults in the building are also modeling. So if we're teaching young people to take three deep breaths to calm down when we get upset, <coughs> we as adults take three deep breaths and calm down when we get upset as well. Just a quick note on that. We are actually in some of our professional development days and in some of our staff meetings having teachers come and share one of the things that they're trying with their students. Or if we're setting up a professional development day, giving teachers time to um, maybe take a walk outside or to um, have some sort of um, uh, growth mindset activity that we do with them so that then they can take it back to their classroom. And, and, and you know, think about this in terms of in-school time, that at least what about for families? That uh, what was happening in it in terms of expanding this work in the families as well? Yeah, thanks Jim. So um, as part of our strategic plan, um, the school district is investing in training um, of district personnel. And they're, they're using the William James College program. Um, and they have the elementary school um, champions certified in this program. And every year, they're going to send a couple of people from, from the other schools. And, that, and that's a graduate program in school climate and social emotional learning yes. that William James College offers, where teams uh, from districts come together and over the course of the year, receive graduate credit um, and develop a social emotional learning plan for their community. Yes, yes. And, and one of the first things we're doing is, in parallel with that, um, is we're using another curriculum based on the Castle curriculum. And um, we're doing both a, a school-based teacher book study and also a community-based family book study. And um, this is the book, Social Emotional Learning. And I'm, for example, I'm championing a, a book group at our elementary school, and we're going to get a group of parents together who are interested, and we're going to go through this book, knowing that in parallel, the teachers of our school are going through the classroom version of this book, with the goal of building a common language and um, you know, really having that family buy-in to this, this curriculum uh, for the district. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And, and then just in terms of, um, of what you said about you know, language with grids and and um, things like that. You know, my eight-year-olds will come to me and they'll tell me, you know, Mom, I think you have a fixed mindset about this. <laughs> so you know, you know that this, this information is getting to them so that they can put it in context. So that, that, that's pretty powerful. Yes. Not only are these ideas being modeled and reinforced throughout the school day, um, that adults at home are also involved, and now the kids are starting to call us on it. So. That's a powerful sign. But, um, but Jennifer, coming into uh, to Ashland uh, and being responsible for coordinating SEL for the district, uh, uh, how do you even go about finding out what's happening? What's, what's in place around SEL? What's, what's the process you're using? That has been my life for the last few months. Um, I have, um, what I really started is, is really um, with a needs assessment. So I started with um, meeting with all the council staff um, individually, 
um, then I met with all the principals, um, and then I went and I started um, meeting with teachers, and then I started meeting with different community groups um, to really get a sense of what is um, currently in place in Ashland, um, what is working, what isn't working, um, and where are those areas that we, we need to improve in. Um, so I think that um, one of the, the resources I think is in your packet um, that I used to kind of get me started um, was um, CASA's District Resource Center. Um, and if you are advocating for your district or you are working in a current district, I highly recommend it um, because there's a lot of great examples in there of um, you know, sort of different social emotional pieces of all three tiers that Jim was talking about before. Um, and you can figure out, um, you know, there's a lot of great templates that we think is free. Um, and that was a really um, sort of good starting point for me um, in doing that, that needs assessment to figure out what we had in place. So, so the District Board Resource Center, you're saying, it is a free resource uh, at council.org, C-A-S-E-L, um, and Castle is a national nonprofit, actually. The reputation is international at this point. Um, but that offers a whole series of resources. Uh, if you're looking at this from a district perspective, it even kind of walks you through an assessment of what's happening around SEL in your district, and then provides examples of how things have been done in a variety of districts around the country. Um, so that, that's one free resource that anybody can use if you're thinking about SEL from your own community. Um, but quickly, I'm wondering, you know, when we're talking about figuring out what plans are that are in place, that as an elected official, as a school committee member, that um, you also have some responsibility around seeing how things are actually being carried out. Um, and can you talk a little about, about how is that important? First of all, we are the budget and policy arm of the district. So it is our goal to make sure that our dollars are spent well and spent efficiently in making sure they, um, they're benefiting the child the most. Um, we're part of the strategic vision, we're part of checks and balances. Um, so we advocate we're not part of the day-to-day -day operations, but we make sure that we support what's going on in the district. And the best thing that we can do as a school committee is to hire a superintendent that believes in this work. That when a, a superintendent that believes that all means all with helping all children to make sure we're successful. Um, and supporting a district, we have a, um, a health and wellness director who is phenomenal in building up the district, bringing back best practices, and we have a long-term strategic plan um, to support. So we have so many incredible things going on. I don't know if you want me to say a few of them. Sure. Okay. Um, we have a bridge program which we help children readjust to school after me mental health uh, hospitalizations, uh, food insecurity, we make sure our children are fed on out of school time, on, on weekends, on vacations, in the summertime. Uh, we have a policy that no student will be denied a lunch. Um, we monitor who attends school sports and programming. Um, we have a new program called Parent-Teacher Home Visits. We um, are working on providing more recess and opportunities for play because play is necessary for developing self-regulation as well as promoting language, cognition, and social competence. Um, we're trying to put the child development back into the curriculum um, and the standards and less emphasis on testing, especially in K through six. Um, but we've worked with everything from fidgets, active desks, rela relaxation rooms, yoga, meditation. We, have, we use positive behavioral intervention and supports. We have a wellness team. Um, we have a, a homeless McKinney Vento clinical care coordinator. We started a 
uh, a clinic in our high school with adolescent nurses. We have an attendance officer that deals with children that are chronically absent. Um, we have a bridge for resilient youth in transition um, that supports kids that are um, coming back to school with a serious emotional problem. We have a responsive classroom, restorative justice, restraint training, um, individual student success plans, which include behavior, attendance, and grades, um, clear consequences, restorative circles, um, and our superintendent just started a no homework night. So labor children are very excited about that. They have less stress. There'll be no homework on Labor Day or Halloween. So, so generally, it sounds like, as I know in each of these districts, that you know, what you looked at is, oh, how do you create the, the structures to support the, the explicit teaching of these social emotional skills and competencies? through things like Response to Classroom, which is another evidence-based program. Um, but then you've also looked really at the entire environment that supports the child. So if the child has learned how to calm down when they're upset, has learned how to listen well and solve problems, but comes to school hungry, then it's pretty hard for them to do any of the rest of this. So you're really looking at the overall condition really thinking about the whole child. Um, and that, that's really showing the kind of empathy that we're helping young people develop as well. It's, it's really thinking about the conditions from the perspective of the child and the family um, in a caring way. So that, that, that seems like another way of kind of modeling social emotional learning that, that you were just describing. But, um, so I'm curious that if people wanted to advocate for more social emotional learning, or sort of more comprehensive social emotional learning in their communities. Um, what are some things that you would suggest? Uh, and, and I'm just thinking about for, for your different roles. That if, as a parent, how, how do you advocate for social emotional learning? Well, I think you, you advocate for your child when they need it. But I think that when you see something that doesn't seem right, I think you can bring it to the attention of a number of people. I know that I've spoken to our um, principals in, in the building um, to kind of identify that there may be a need. Um, school committee is very responsive uh, to inquiries. I can say one or two emails from the parents of school committee gets their attention very quickly. Um, and I also think that you can look at engaged parent groups like CPAC. Um, and you know, then find parents who are willing to kind of take action and, and help move some of these ideas and questions forward. So that's, that's I think, those are the places to start with the parents. And at least for, for folks who aren't familiar, what, what does CPAC stand for? I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, so that's the Special Education Parent Alliance Advisory Council. Thank you. I totally blanked on that before, and I didn't get a chance. Yeah, so special education parent advisory council. So we are um, a, a completely volunteer arm of um, special education program, and we work with parents as like parent volunteers to help other parents navigate the special education system. Um, and we also meet with our special education staff at the district to talk about um, how special education is being implemented. And, and what about the role of an educator? What can an educator do to advocate in their own community? Well, I was going to just add in there our parent-teacher organization and our school council. The other thing is always communicate with your classroom teacher. I mean, they're the they're the in in for lack of a better word trenches with your child. You know, start there, and they will bring it to us at staff meetings and at um, at our grade leader meetings, and we. At, at our level, then bring it up to our administrative meetings, and we bring it up as a topic there. And I would imagine when more people are asking about social emotional learning, the, then the easier it is for those of you who are out there doing work to do your jobs. The, the being on the school committee and continually championing social emotional learning must make a difference to folks who are district administrators 
who are building against figures. Having parents ask about social emotional learning um, helps the teachers know that this really is a priority. Um, and that if they invest their own professional time and energy, that the parents are, are appreciative of that um, and aren't going to be asking why it's not all about reading, writing, and living tech. And, and uh, in just a second, to over for some questions from the rest of you. So we'll be thinking about uh, things that you might like to ask uh, of any of us here on the panel. Um, but I guess well, I'll, I'll ask one more question of the group here, which is that uh, is there a particular resource that you would suggest to folks um, if they want to get more involved in social emotional learning? Uh, anything you would suggest for that? So I, I think just because we're so focused on this book study, I really do think that this is, from a parent perspective, that this book, Social Emotional Learning in the Home, is really a great resource. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's why I would start kind of giving kind of an overview from a uh, layperson's perspective about what social emotional learning is. And Jenna, uh, you mentioned the District Resource Center. Uh, <laughs> that's Could I add one more <laughs> I, what I found is that as I immerse myself in all the um, information that's available about social emotional learning, it can become a little um, overwhelming. So I did want to share, um, I recently found, um, recently, actually in October, a guide um, to resources um, kind of to social emotional learning um, came out from the state of California. Um, and this is an amazing resource. Um, I really like it because it, um, is a snapshot of different types of all free and um, uh, available online resources that you can use um, in your schools, in your districts, um, at a home level, a community level as well, um, to, um, to start um, integrating social emotional learning. Um, really, really a nice guy. So I would definitely invest in that resources as well. So that's something I would um, really highly recommend. And all the resources that folks are mentioning um, will be at that link, uh, sclmass.org slash forum. Um, many of them are there already, and then others that folks have mentioned tonight will be there by tomorrow morning. Um, but let's get some questions from the room. Massachusetts is part of 
the Collaborative Bracket and Social Emotional Learning in Castles Collaborating States Initiative. So it was a team from the Department of Education and a few other stakeholders, uh, part of a national community of practice uh, around SEL. Uh, and even within the standards for teachers, for new teachers, there's a particular indicator about that the teacher has studied around social emotional learning. And we're looking to see that increase, maybe in this legislative session, to be that they don't, don't have to just study, but they have to actually demonstrate the ability, um, as is required in some other areas. Uh, and that's one of the things we're advocating for. Um, and we have many teachers who are part of SEL for Maps that we don't provide teacher training because there are many organizations like the Center for Responsive Schools, the Responsive Classroom, Open Circle, uh, other organizations that provide that kind of training. That we're a grassroots advocacy group, um, but we have teachers who are working with us. We help provide teachers and, and many others in the community with the kind of tools they, they want and need to amplify their voices um, and, and to think about what does an effective plan look like in their communities. Um, and many teachers, many teachers come to our events, which are some regional planning events as well. Um, and we welcome teachers very deeply. Other questions? Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, I have uh, two kids in the Ashton School District. So, Jennifer, this uh, is a question mostly for you or for anybody who wants to address it. I'm just wondering, uh, I'm, I'm aware of what our district does with regard to social emotional learning especially with elementary school kids. Um, and I'm wondering, as my kids get older, what they're going to be seeing in middle school and high school. OK, great question. So I think that um, when I did my sort of needs assessment of what was in place, um, I was able to find um, uh, social emotional learning going on at all levels. Um, in our middle school, um, we are looking at um, having a specific um, curriculum, or perhaps we're going to look at, um, actually in February, starting to trial um, some different programs out to see what is effective for our students and our community. Um, I think the, the middle school is, an, is um, just an age group in general that um, really needs a lot of social emotional support. Um, our counselors um, at the middle school level currently go in and uh, do lessons, um, and that's something that we want to increase. Um, and we really are looking at integrating um, social emotional um, instruction um, into sort of all parts of um, you know the academic piece in the middle school and high school. Um, and that's something that um, our K to five schools um, have started responsive classroom. Um, this year, and um, so they're really starting to do that. So I think that it's um, a conversation and um, certainly an area that um, I will be building as we go along. Um, at our middle school, um, the teachers are having conversations in their staff meetings about what is what are they currently doing um, to, to foster social emotional learning skills and teach them. Um, and, and then we're, we're going to be working together to really expand that. So I think that I can't tell you a specific curriculum right now, um, but my next step is really to start reaching out to parents. So um, I would love <laughs> to have you as part of a parent group. One thing that we're also, I'm also looking into doing is um, book studies with our teachers and their parents. So I'm excited to hear that you're doing that in the um, So definitely is, is all on the horizon of what, of what we're looking at as a district. And again, that's a great kind of question to be asking um, because it can spark that whole conversation that knowing that, that families at home care about SEL across the age levels um, often can, can provide support to the district that when you're thinking, you're thinking about that kind of comprehensive plan. So just, just raising that kind of question and raising it in a public forum can be one very powerful thing to do. And then just to keep asking. Yes? Sorry, is there one 
who had her hand up for, for a while back there. But then uh, this woman here and the gentleman up front. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, my name is Mary Lee, and I um, am a professor teaching at Salem State University. And what I have done over the years is try to implement these kind of uh, this kind of learning. My background is as a counseling psychologist, but I think that um, what I have tried to use uh, in my own personal practice and research is to mainstream counseling uh, counseling uh, practice and widen it to everybody because counseling is about communicating and communicating is something that we all need to be able to do. So um, in working in school, you know, some teachers might say, uh, I'm not a counselor, I don't know how to do that. That's not my role, and that's not my practice. And my sense is that it's everybody's practice, and if people understand how to communicate, which is a big part of social emotional learning, it's such an important thing. So I, I called it peer counseling, co-counseling, um, right now I'm calling it uh, emotional literacy. And one of the things that I, that I have found, um, and I think that you know, other teachers here maybe and working in right now in this the atmosphere, the national atmosphere of our country as well as internationally. I just I was teaching in China last year these concepts, emotional literacy, is that it is very tied to how people treat or don't treat each other. So you cannot separate out emotional literacy and understanding social emotional learning and separate that out from issues of power, uh, race, and class. And I think that those kind of things really um, to, to make it uh, make this kind of learning accessible to everybody. So I think it's, first of all, I, I think it's great that this is happening because you brought everybody together and you know the state is involved in, and you're giving away free information that's very useful, right? But and I just think that it's so important that we get together and try to, you know, make this kind of information not just accessible to elementary school, it starts there, but also to middle school, like this woman was talking about, and also in high school and in colleges and in the workplace where people often don't treat each other very well. And if they had a better understanding of social, emotional concepts and practice, you gotta practice, right? that um, it will make a huge difference. Thank you. So, that's, so I want to say that thank you, and I'd like to be more involved and to help promote this work. Excellent. Thank you. Clearly, social emotional learning and competencies resonate in so many areas of our lives. Um, and you also make a good point, too, about the role of higher education. Uh, many institutions like Salem State, certainly Framingham State has been doing a lot to promote social emotional learning, um, including in the teacher education program. And that we at SEL Mass have a consortium around social emotional learning in teacher education. So that as teachers come to these wonderful districts, that they already in their pre-service work have been learning about social emotional learning um, and are able to bring them to their practice. Uh, rather than needing to learn that on the job, since particularly since it's such a key area. Uh, and I think we've got time for about two more questions, and we'll move back here and then the gentleman right here. Well, it's funny because my question is segueing from things you touched on. So I want to sell the nation and the world, right? We want everyone to be, you know, uh, socially, emotionally competent. 
So what I was wondering is, has there already started, or can we start, um, campaigning to get the government, do you remember the Schoolhouse Rock commercials, right? And they kind of never forgot it. It was a good way to spread that information in a fun way to everyone. And I was wondering if we could, um, you know, start pushing to get the government, hopefully, to pay for or someone get commercials on too, in on all the channels, different languages, you know, to start teaching, to start reminding people, to start affecting the culture that way to the media. Mm -hmm. So, so a series of you know, a series of public service announcements about feeling upset, take three deep breaths. <laughs> There's actually there's a pilot program of exactly that that's happening in Newton on the public access cable right now. Um, so if you'd like to get involved with that, that's exactly the kind of thing that we at SEO from Mass do. Uh, so we love to, and we have Jeff Gentleman, the uh, last question, because over here we'll see the time for one more. Well, uh, Ron Chick, Framingham. I'm a retired Framingham teacher, and I have the pleasure of teaching the Open Circle program for 25 years. I was also a trainer at the Stone Center at Boston College, training teachers. And it became a foundation of my teaching. It was, it, it made everything work. And uh, one thing I would advocate for is administrative and school committee support, providing funding, and providing adequate training and curriculum. And the Open Circle program had a differentiated curriculum, K through five. I used it in six when I taught sixth, fifth, fourth, third, and second. So very successful program. Thanks for underscoring and reinforcing some of the things that we haven't talked about. All right. Um, thank you so much. And uh, back to the Senate President. Thank you, Jim. I, I do just want to answer that last question or comment, too. I do believe that the districts in the Metro West support social and emotional learning just by listening to the panelists and seeing who's here. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you again. And could everybody give a really big round of applause to the panel, to, to Jim, to Jennifer, Deb, Thank you so much for a great job. I do just want to also acknowledge that uh, former state senator and my friend and colleague Dave Mignani is here uh, to recognize him. Great to see you, a tremendous advocate and champion of education in the Commonwealth. Uh, this was, as I mentioned, the third in a series. The first one, uh, for folks that may not have been there, we had Ruth Cross from the Castle Group from Chicago that was noted. Uh, we were lucky to have her out here. We had the second one, the Rennie Center, and this time, uh, SEL for Massachusetts. So thank you so much. I would really, really appreciate your feedback. I just will say it one more time. Let us know if we need to go in depth more on certain levels, more granular. Let us know if we're going too granular, if we should be going higher level. Just give us our, your feedback, so because we will be doing another one uh, next year, and so we want to be able to provide information that you all feel is the most helpful, uh, that, that will continue what you're doing and help dive into this process and this whole uh, critically important issue more. Again, thank you to our friends in the Learning Center. It's great to have you here. Thank you to all of you. Have a happy and healthy new year and safe travels home. Thank you.